this this picture is in fact on one of the front of your handouts, maybe the first handout. You don't need it here. It's just a reminder of where we are in our layered stack. The one to look at is the middle, the protocols and technologies. Here's our five layer stack from physical layer, data link layer, network, transport, application. That's because communications is a complex task or a complex set of tasks, we often break the tasks into or divide the task into layers where the layers have a, the role of uh, solving some of the problems for communications. Up until now we started with a semester looking at the physical layer, how do we send our data as signals? So we saw different ways of encoding and so on, so there's just some examples in here. Some different media we talked about. More recently we started to look at the data link layer. Even though we can send our data across a link using the physical layer, we know that in some cases there will be errors and we want to avoid those errors and fix them if possible. So the last topic we looked at some protocols for flow control and error control, the stop and wait, uh, sliding windows, selective reject as some of the concepts that we've spoken about. There are many technologies used in here that we haven't mentioned much about. That is, technologies that implement the concepts we've talked about. In your assignment, you're studying one of them, which is the wireless LANs, 802.11 wireless LANs. That falls within the data link layer and the physical layer. The focus so far has been on how do we get data across a link from A to B. Okay. Of course, we may need to be able to, well, we often want to communicate with not just someone at the other end point of the link, but further away. So now we're going to deal with how do we communicate not just across a single link, but now if we have A wants to communicate with C, and they don't have a direct link to C, then how do they get data from A to C? Well, that is, we form a network where maybe A connects to B, B connects to some other device, and that other device connects to C. So this is a network, or a simple network, where we have multiple links connected together. So that now we know some concepts of how to get data across the link, we want to look at how do we get data from one source node on the network to another destination node on the network across multiple links. And we're going to talk about some technologies today which are related to how do we get data across the network and in the next few topics, so we're moving towards the network layer. In fact, some of the technologies we talk about today cut across these layers. It's not a simple division, they're all to do with the network layer. They, they have tasks across these layers. But we're moving up. So we're going to introduce what we mean by a network and how do we get the data across the network and that we'll refer to as switching, the concept of what is switching and how do we perform, uh, what different types of switching we have, circuit and packet switching. So let's first talk about what is a communications network, in particular a switched communications network. So we've focused on over a link. How do we connect net multiple devices together? Well, we create a network. And some of the terminology that we'll use is that to send from one source A to some destination C, we need to send through some intermediate nodes, okay? some other nodes. And We'll use this concept of switching, which we'll explain shortly, but these intermediate nodes will send the data in the right direction to the destination. These intermediate nodes we'll refer to as switching nodes. In general, switching nodes. They've got more specific names, but they're switches, in short. Why? Because, in fact, in real life, B may have links not just to A and D, but to other nodes as well. and they may have links to other nodes. And they may then link into C. So when data goes from A to B with the destination of C, B has three choices really. To get the data to C, send it to D, E or F. 
So there's two problems here. How do you know which is the best direction? That's not what we're covering yet. We're going to cover that in the next topic, which is routing. Uh, but why do we call it a switch? Because if the data comes in, let's say we're going to send it in this direction to D, then we think of it as a switch. We send the data in this direction. If we wanted to send to E, the switch goes to E and, or to F. So B can switch between the different destinations to get to the ultimate destination C. So B is a switching node, or simply a switch <coughs> in this case. In communication networks which use switching, we assume that those switching nodes are not concerned with what the data is that's being communicated from A to C. A wants to send a file to C. B doesn't care what the contents of that file is, it just treats it as some data, any type of data. B's responsibility is just to get the data to the destination. It has no, uh, no need to know what the content of the data is. So whether the data is a file, it's a request for a web page, or if it's part of a voice call, from B's perspective it doesn't care. It treats them all the same, it's just data. So the switching nodes are not concerned with the, the content of the data. Of course the source and destination are. A collection of nodes, like we have in this example, we refer to as a communications network, or simply a network. So this is our network. We will distinguish between the switching nodes, the intermediate nodes in the middle, and the source and destination devices. And those devices, the sources and destinations, are called generally stations. So they care about the data. Their role is not per to perform switching. They generate the data and receive the data. The switching nodes forward the data to the right destination. So the diagram I have on the right is in fact this example while we're going through. So in this example, in an example communications network, we have seven switching nodes so the circles, or close to circles, with some links between them, just in an example network, and six stations, where a station is attached to one of the switching nodes, and usually just one switching node. So A is connected to four. Normally the, the station to node links, like A to four, are dedicated point to point links. So Computer A has a cable going into switch 4, for example. And all of the data that computer A generates and receives goes across that cable. No one else uses that cable. It's only for the communications to and from A. That's why we say it's typically from the stations to nodes, or node station links, dedicated point-to-point -point links, just for their use. For node or node to node or switch to switch, so four to seven, four to five, these links may be shared amongst multiple users, amongst multiple stations. That is, when A generates data to send to E and B generates data to send to F, for example, then if the data goes in this direction, then this link between 4 and 7 may carry the data of both B and A. And how do we do that? We mentioned it just briefly last week. We use multiplexing, or we can use multiplexing. That is, end users or stations have their own link, but the switching nodes, instead of having a separate link for all the end users, they have a link that can carry the data of multiple users. So we can think the capacity of these links will often be larger than the uh, station links. So we may use multiplexing across these links. All we know from last week, multiplexing allows us to carry the data from multiple users on a single link. What else can we say about our, our network? So this is a typical situation where we have 
stations connected to nodes or switches. The connections between the nodes or switches, there may be multiple paths between a pair, of, a pair of stations. Generally, it's not a fully connected network. A fully connected network would mean that 4 has a link to all other switches. Okay? 4 has a direct link to 1, 2, 3, 5, 6 and 7. That would be a fully connected network. Well, also if 7 has a link to all the switches and 5 to all the switches. Generally it's not a fully connected network. That is, the network, some of the nodes may connect to some of the other nodes, but not to all of them. Often there will be multiple paths between each pair of stations. What's a path? From station A to station F, for example, one path in this example is via 4, 7 and 6. Another path is 4, 5, 6. Another path, 1, 2, sorry, 4, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. So there are multiple paths from this one source station to this one destination station. So a pair of stations, <coughs> it's desirable to have multiple possible paths. Except that, but the network is generally not fully connected. Fully connected will require many, many links, and it's generally not feasible. With switching networks, we're now talking about well, it's a general concept of using switching, but it's commonly seen in large wide area networks. So the examples you think of is, say, a network covering Bangkok. There's a telecommunications company that has uh, connection, has nodes or switches throughout Bangkok in different locations and they have links between them. Or covering Thailand. So there may be switches, multiple switches in each city, or each major city. And then they have links between them. So creating a switch network across the country. Or between countries even. Okay, they are the common examples where we see switching networks in wide area networks. We're going to look at, well there are two, two problems here. One is if we want to get data from A to F, as an example, which path to take? Okay, do you go 476, 456, 412356? Okay, that's one problem, which path to take. And that's solved using routing. Find the, the best path or find the best route from source to destination. That's the next topic. We will not cover that yet. We'll assume that magically we can find the best path. The other problem is once we know the path to take, how do we send the data to the, from source to destination? And that's what we'll talk about today, the switching techniques. And there are two technologies used. And we distinguish between what's called circuit switching and packet switching. How do we, what does this node do in terms of when it receives data, it switches between 1, 5 and 7. How does it forward the data through the network? There are two different approaches. We'll explain what they mean. In fact, in packet switching, we'll even break it into two more sub approaches. One's called datagram packet switching and the other's called virtual circuit packet switching. So we'll end up with three approaches. Circuit switching, datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. We'll go through them. We'll use this example through some of the uh, slides so we'll, I'll leave it on the board here. So of course this is a simple network. Imagine a network across Thailand where maybe across Bangkok there may be tens of switches. In larger cities there may be several or tens of switches. And then in the smaller cities or towns there may be one switch. And they're all connected together. So we may have hundreds, 100 plus switches and many links. So a network covering the country will be much more complex than this. More, more 
switches and more links. Possibly more paths to take and longer paths to take. And more stations. A switch maybe uh, have multiple stations connected. For example, an internet service provider may provide a, a, a switch and all the customers connect into that switch. So all the customers in one area connect into that one switch. So we may have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of customers coming into one switch. In this example, we just keep it simple with six. Let's look at the two different ways to get data from, <coughs> say, A to F. Circuit and packet switching. And then we'll compare, <coughs> once we go through how they work, we'll compare them, we'll come back to each of them and say, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Circuit switching. And circuit switching developed mainly for telephone networks. So telephone networks have been around for 100 years. So this is the older technology compared to the packet switching. It's been around for a long time and in use for a long time. When you make a telephone call, at least in the old days, you'd pick up your phone, your home telephone line, and your home has a link into a telephone exchange. And you'd pick up the phone and you'd, someone would answer. So some worker in the tel telephone exchange would answer and you'd say, I want to talk to John. His number is 123. And what the staff in the telephone exchange would do is connect your line, so your line would be one of these ports here, to John's line using some cable. So they'll manually connect your telephone line to the destination's telephone line. This is a telephone switch or an example of a circuit switch. The workers here are performing the task of switching. They're connecting two lines together via this intermediate switch. In telephone networks today, the same approach is used, except the switches are not people there, they are digital switches. So they are computers that do it automatically. But basically, when you pick up your phone, you dial in a number. At the telephone exchange, there's some signaling that goes along such that the telephone exchange, the switch, will connect your telephone line to the next line. So here, if four is the telephone exchange and this is you calling, they'll make a connection. If you're calling F, connect your line to a line here. And similar, they'll connect at this telephone exchange, connect the line coming in here to here, and then at six, that's what happens at the switches. In the past, it was manual and Today it's automatic using digital switches. And the result is once that connection is set up, you can talk and you have a link from A all the way through to F. It's as if you have a, a physical cable all the way from source to destination. Because you have a cable from A to 4, now that this circuit is set up, it's connected at the switch, between this cable and this one, then we, you can think if this is a computer, we have a, a link going through it. And then we have a cable from four to seven and then direct connected from here to here and so on. So essentially from A through to F, there's one long cable, one long link. Well, that's the intention of, of circuit switching. In practice, we may be using multiplexing here. There may be one link, we only use a part of it, but the from the perspective of the source and destination, once circuit switching, once the circuit has been set up, it's as if there's one link from A through to F and they can send their data. So circuit switching developed for telephone networks and has been extended when telephone networks were started to be used for not just telephone calls but data. Okay, people wanted to send not just uh, voice calls but send data across the networks and circuit switching was still used there for data communications. So the switches 
establish a, a connection between the input link and the output link. And that's done all along the path until we have a circuit, what we say a circuit from A, the source, through to F, the destination. We create a dedicated communications path between the source and destination station where that path is a sequence of links between the nodes. This, so on each physical link, say from a link from 4 to 7, because we may be using multiplexing, and we didn't talk about any details of multiplexing, we may refer to the, the data from A to F going along the link from 4 to 7 as a channel. And that's some terminology that we skipped over in terms of multiplexing. Because this link, the real link, may be shared amongst not just A to F, but also B to E and other stations. For this to work, before we send data from A to F, we need to establish this circuit or connection. If A wants to send data to F, it needs to tell somehow the switching nodes that it wants to establish a connection to F. And then when it tells the switching nodes, they will connect the lines together. And once they're connected, like we have in this diagram, A can send the data all the way through to F. So we break it into three phases. We establish a circuit or connection then once the circuit is established, we can transfer the data. And when we've finished transferring the data, we may disconnect the circuit or connection. We tear it down. We terminate or, dis or, or tear down the circuit. So we'll go through those phases uh, and later compare how that works or compare it against packet switching. In, in a telephone network, when you pick up the phone, okay, you'll hear some dial tone, then you enter in a number, a telephone number, you want to call, and when you enter in that telephone number, that's when the telephone network establishes the connection to the destination. So, here's my telephone, station A, I pick up the phone, and I enter in a phone number, and as a result, the telephone starts to send some signals to the local telephone exchange, which I'm connected to. And the signals uh, depend upon the phone number I'm call calling. And the telephone exchange then chooses the destination, the next node to connect to, based on who I'm calling. If I'm calling person F, so the telephone number of F, then if this telephone exchange can accept my telephone call, then it sends a signal onto 7, which then sends it onto 6, and then onto F, and that's when F's telephone rings. Okay? This is from when you enter in the phone number until when the destination telephone starts ringing, because the signal has been sent through. They, their phone is ringing when they pick it up, then that's an indicator that the call has been accepted by the receiver, some response comes back, and that's the establishment of the circuit. So this process of dialing in the phone number, sending a message to their telephone number via the switches, and the response, someone picks up the phone, that the switches during that stage are establishing the circuit, setting up the connection. So it all happens in a, a matter of milliseconds, quite quickly. And once the connection is set up, you can talk. Okay? If you dial in the number and it's still ringing, then of course you cannot talk because the connection has not been accepted by the receiver or set up. So we set up the connection and then we transfer the data. So the telephone call is the, the first use of circuit switching, but it can also be applied to data communications not just telephone calls, with your old dial-up modem, similar approach. 
you create a connection to an ISP server, and then you send data across that telephone network. And other networks use this concept. Have we got an example? We have. So with circuit switching, a path is created or established before the data transfer begins. So before A starts sending data at F, there's a path selected, in this example, 476, and established. For this circuit to be established, there must be enough resources to accept the circuit, to accept the connection. And the example back to the telephone network, you pick up your phone, num your phone you dial in the destination phone number, it's possible that one of the telephone exchanges, say the local telephone exchange, is busy. We said last week that there's only enough capacity to support a certain number of telephone calls on this line. If everyone, is, everyone else is currently making a telephone call, this has a capacity or that to support 100 calls, and you make, you're the 101st person, then you'll get the busy signal and you will not be able to establish the circuit. So for this circuit establishment to be successful, all of the telephone exchanges along the path must have enough resources to accept that connection. So there's some check. When you make a call, can this one support the call? Yes. Can this one support the call? Yes. Can this one? No. Then the, if this one cannot support the telephone call, then your call is rejected. Okay? That is, you'll get some uh, busy signal or some uh, um, signal back indicating you cannot call that person. So the resources we need to establish, if we think from the perspective of data communications, we need resources at this switch. If we're sending data through here, enough resources to process the data being sent through, and enough capacity on the links. If this supports 100 telephone calls or 100 megabits per second, whether we talk about calls or, or data, then we need to keep track of how much is in use at this point in time. If this is the capacity and currently in use is 98%, and when we set up a new connection, we need to use four units. Then if A wants to connect to F and use four units of bandwidth, so say four megabits per second, if these are in megabits per second, then this call would be rejected. We have a capacity of 100. We're currently using 98 across this link. If we want to use four, there's not enough. Okay. If we want to use one, then there is enough, and across this link it would be accepted. So one of the resources that we may need to check is the capacity of, of the links. The node 4 knows the capacity, it knows the current resource usage, it knows what A requires, and therefore can make a decision, can I accept your call or not? Okay. And the same across each of the links. Seven checks. If node A requires to set up the call two units, then across this link we'd be okay. We have a capacity of 100, current use is 98. So we'd accept it from this perspective, but here if we have a capacity of 50 and the current use is 49, then 7 would reject that call or re reject that circuit establishment because there's not enough available resources here. If all the links have enough resources and all the switches have enough resources, then the connection be, can be created. So when we establish a circuit in circuit switching, we check if there is enough resources. And if there are, then those resources are reserved for that connection. Let's see another example. This link has a capacity of 50 and current use is 40. 
this link has a capacity of let's ignore the last link that's a point to point link this is a shared link so A wants to set up a connection to F it requires a capacity or it requires a bandwidth of two units ignore the units this switch just looks at the capacity here of 100 supports current use is 98 we can accept okay so let's record this 98 now becomes when we accept it now becomes 100 okay because now we have reserved for a to f an extra 2 so switch 4 keeps track of who is using this capacity of 100. Currently there are other people using it. When A sets up the connection it is reserved 2 of the total capacity of 100. And similar 7 accepts the connection so this becomes 42 and keeps track that it reserves for this link from A to F 2 units and then we accept the connection. <coughs> so we reserve the resources throughout that path. And this is both an advantage and a disadvantage of circuit switching. The advantage is if we reserve the resources throughout the path, then A can always have those resources available. They can always send at a, using the bandwidth of two, or say two megabits per second. The disadvantage of this approach is that Sometimes A has no data to send. It reserves two units, and across this path, two units are reserved for data from A to F. But sometimes if A's got nothing to send to F, maybe for a period of one second there's no data to send, then for this link, reserved for A to F is two units, but nothing is being sent across that link, which is inefficient. So we reserve the resources. No one else can use those resources. So if B wants to set up a connection to E via this link from 4 to 7, there's not enough capacity here because we're using the 100% of the capacity. Even if A is not sending any data to F at that point in time, no one else can make use of it. So we have an absolute reservation of the resources for the nodes which establish a circuit. That can be inefficient because when they don't use those resources, no one else can use them. I'll come back and give you an example of and compare that to packet switching once we go through packet switching. So we reserve resources along the path they are allocated and then we send our data this is designed for circuit switching was designed for voice traffic when we make a voice call it works quite well for voice traffic because we need to reserve enough capacity for people to talk to send the voice data and it's quite easy to predict how long the typical phone call will last for uh, and to predict how many resources are needed for each voice call is used for data traffic, for example, accessing websites, downloading files, but not so efficient for data traffic compared to, compared to voice traffic. The best example of circuit, switch is, circuit switching is in public telephone networks. So the home telephone network and the networks that connect across the world use circuit switching. Private telephone networks use circuit switching. A private telephone network is, for example, connecting all the phones in this campus, all the office phones. We don't pay anyone to use that telephone network. It's our private phone network inside the building okay, or inside the campus. That can use circuit switching. Also, there's a spelling mistake, private data networks. And a common example is banks. So a bank has offices throughout the country. They have telemachines, thousands of telemachines at different locations. They need to connect them all together so that the telemachines can communicate back to the offices 
about how much money you're in people's accounts and so on. So a common way for banks to, in the past at least, to connect all their telemachines, all their branch offices together was using a circuit switching network, but it was a private network. They owned the cables, they owned the infrastructure in that network, but used circuit switching to exchange data, not voice, but data between the different stations. So circuit switching developed for telephone networks, but also used in data networks. Some further examples. This is of the telephone line. So here's, don't worry too much about the terminology, but this is a telephone exchange, the end office. So your local telephone exchange. Here's your uh, the telephone of different users. And of course, Here's one local telephone exchange and another one in a different area of the city and those telephone exchanges are connected together via another telephone exchange. So, if you go back to this simple case here, user A wants to call user B, then user A picks up the phone, tells the operator who they want to talk to and the operator a picks up the phone, tells the operator in the telephone exchange, I want to talk to B. The operator connects them direct to B. So now, when the data is sent, that is, the voice is sent, it goes across this line through and comes back direct to B. Okay. If C makes a call and says they want to talk to D, then the operator needs to check, okay, well D is not on this exchange, they're on some other exchange, so they connect to this intermediate exchange, which then connects to it, this, this other lower level exchange, and then onto D. So it, we have a hierarchy of exchanges. So if you want to talk to someone in another country, then it goes through multiple exchanges, where the exchanges are the switching nodes in this case and we establish a circuit. Again, make this point multiple times that it's as if now C has a link all the way through to D. They can send their signals and it's as if that signal that they transmit, some analog signal, just flows through this long link and is received by D. Okay. And another example, okay, here we have multiple telephone exchanges. Again, these are the switching nodes and the source and, desti source and destination. With circuit switching, we establish a circuit before we send the data. And when we establish the circuit, we check are there enough resources to support the data transfer. If yes, circuit is established. If not, circuit is not established. Okay. The resources, for example, enough capacity in the links, enough uh, resources inside the circuit switch. The problem with this reservation is that it becomes inefficient if the end users, the applications, do not always use those resources. I reserve two units, but on average only use one unit. Then there's one unit of resource going to waste because no one else can use it. It's reserved just for A to F. So if I do not use those resources, then it becomes inefficient. The good thing about reserving resources is the quality is guaranteed. Let's say I reserve a 2 megabit per second connection from my computer to the YouTube web server. Both directions. If I use circuit switching there, then it means I'm guaranteed from my computer to the YouTube web server 2 megabits per second all the time while I've got that circuit established. When I'm downloading data from the YouTube web server, guaranteed to receive the video at 2 megabits per second. That would be good. I would get no variations in the quality of the video. So the quality is good if we can guarantee the performance of the connection, guarantee the delay, guarantee the throughput of that connection. 
Of course, we do not use circuit switching to connect to the YouTube web server. We use the alternative packet switching. So circuit switching is good for quality, guaranteed quality, but it can be bad in some cases and it can be inefficient. Another limitation normally of circuit switching is that the end devices, A and F, the capabilities need to be the same. For example, the same link speed. Uh, right, you need to talk. If this is a telephone, it needs to send and receive the same signals as this telephone. If we're using a data network, if this was a one megabit per second link, then this computer would need an interface for a one megabit per second link. Okay. That's not true in packet switching, the next approach. So that's a, a disadvantage of circuit switching. We'll come back to them when we look at the others. So circuit switching, one of the an analogy of circuit switching is when you're driving through Bangkok and there's a VIP that needs to travel into the center of Bangkok, what happens? Some member of parliament, some, what happens? Traffic jam, okay, what happens for that very important person? What do they do to make sure that they avoid the traffic jam? Reserve, reserve the road, okay? If it's a very important person, then they shut down, well, they don't allow other people onto the road, say onto the tollway or on, onto the road, so that the police stop the traffic coming into a road so that that road is reserved for that person, okay? Or that set of cars travelling through. For that period of five or ten minutes, that road is reserved. There's no other cars on the road. From their perspective, they are guaranteed performance. They can drive at 140 kilometres an hour, they're not going to get red lights, they're not going to get slow cars in front of them because the road is reserved for them during that period of time, during that connection. That's an example of circuit switching. You, in advance of transferring your data from source to destination, you reserve some path. In the cars, you reserve a path through the city, a set of roads, by calling the police or whoever in advance. And there's no other traffic using that. There's no other, other traffic to compete with. So you get guaranteed to travel at the speed that you want. Okay? That's an example of circuit switching. And I think you can see that that's good for the data being sent from source to destination but from other people's perspective, they are slowed down. They don't get to use those resources. Okay? So that I cannot drive on that road for some period of time, so it slows down other people in that case. So it can be good if, in coming back to the, the communications network, again, it's good if we use that reserved resources, but inefficient if it's reserved, but no one is using it. So what's an alternative? What's another way? Let's say the people driving through the roads are not so important. What could happen? Well, what happens for you and I when we drive through roads? Do we get any reservations? No, we just drive up to some s traffic lights and we go whenever the person in front of us can go. So there's no concept of reservations for uh, us when we're driving through the roads we'll see that's similar to what we'll see is datagram packet switching. We just send our traffic through the network and there's no reservation in advance. We just get in our car and drive. We don't have to call the police and say we're coming on this path. We just drive on any path that we choose. There's an intermediate approach which we'll go through as well is okay let's say uh, let's say at the traffic lights, there's often, often police officers that work at the traffic lights. When they see another police car approaching, they will stop the other traffic and let that police car go through on the direction that they want. So that's a, a middle case where 
there's some, still some reservation. That is, the police officer at the traffic lights knows that when there's a police car coming, stop the other traffic and let them go through. Okay? So there's some reservation in advance to let the police cars go through. Let's see if we can connect those uh, cases to the different packet switching approaches. With packet switching, we have we'll go through how do we divide into packets. We have two types, datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. And the third that we've just gone through is circuit switching. Briefly, virtual circuit packet switching is we try to be the same as circuit switching. We set up a connection from source to destination and then send our data along that path. So there's some in advance reservation or in advance setting up a connection to know which path to take. Datagram packet switching is the case where we do not set up a connection. We just send our data. Okay? That's the case of you and I driving through the roads. We just choose the drive to an intersection, choose which way to go, and move on to the next intersection and so on. We get, there's no advance warning that we're coming. They are the same in that they use this concept of packet switching, where we take our data that we want to send and divide it into smaller chunks, packets. Okay. So that's the concept of packet switching. In circuit switching, the data to send from A to F, let's say it's a large 10 megabyte file to be sent from A to F, is simply transmitted, not in multiple packets, but transmitted uh, immediately, okay, once we set up a connection. So the signal that represents that data is transmitted from A for circuit switching and the signal passes through the, the links and is received by F. So we just transmit the entire file. No need to break it into packets with circuit switching. Because we have a connection all the way through, we can transmit a signal that uh, passes all the way through to the destination. In packet switching, we do something different. We take our data, say our one megabyte file, and break it into smaller chunks, packets, and send those packets one after another. The advantage we'll see of packet switching is that when some resources are not in use, other packets can make use of those resources. We'll come to that advantage after we go through how it works. So the first thing is that the source has some data to send. We divide it into packets. How big are the packets? It depends upon the system of the network being used. So different protocols will have different limits. Last week we mentioned some of the, the factors that impact upon packet size. The overhead, what if we lose packets and so on. And we normally add a header to those packets. For example, the header would indicate who are we sending this data to? So computer A has some data to send to F. It divides that data into multiple packets and attaches a header to each of those packets. And sends them into the network. So from computer A sends to the switch it's attached to, switch four in this example. And then those packets need to be delivered to the destination F example. And the two approaches, datagram and virtual circuit packet switching. In datagram packet switching, it's easy. Let's say I have 10 packets to send. My data is broken into 10 packets. Computer A sends packet 1, packet 2, packet 3, sends the 10 packets to switch 4. When switch 4 receives a packet, it looks in the header in the header of that packet contains some destination. So let's draw the packet. For example, our packet, one of the packets has some data and a header. And inside that header may be different things, but 
for example, the destination. The destination equals F. And A sends multiple packets to 4, representing the data. When 4, the switch, receives a packet, it looks at the destination in the header. It says, OK, I've got a packet. I need to reach F. It makes a decision to send it to one of the output links in order to reach the destination. Let's say it may choose to send that packet to node 7. And it's just the destination of F, and here's our data. That's, for example, packet 1. But A sends multiple packets to 4, say 10 packets. The point in datagram packet switching is that the switch, the packet switch, does not treat or does not connect the packets with each other. It treats them independently. So when 4 receives the first packet, it looks, destination is F, decides to send it to 7. When it receives the second packet, it does the same thing. It looks at the destination and decides who to send it to. But it's independent of the previous packet. The decision to send it to the next node is independent of the previous packet. Even though the 10 packets represent one piece of data from source A to F, the switches treat those packets independently. In theory, what could happen is that packet 1 goes to 7, packet 2 goes to 5, packet 3 goes to 7, and packets all coming from the data from A to F go in different directions through our network. And they all arrive along different paths to F. Okay? So that's possible with datagram packet switching. The switches just treat the packets as they receive them. They do not care about how they relate to previous packets. That's datagram packet switching. The result is that packets belonging to the same application data, the same message, may take different paths across the network. Some of the packets may go this path, some may go this longer path. And the end result of that is that some packets may arrive out of order at the destination. We pa send packets 1 and 3 through this short path and send packet 2 through a longer path. It's possible that packet 1 arrives, then packet 3 arrives, and then packet 2 arrives. So they arrive out of order at the destination. If that happens, then the, somehow the destination needs to put them back into order. In datagram packet switching, the packets have headers, so the switches know where to send them. Okay? So the switch knows it needs to get to F. Send to the next node such that it should get to destination F. How to choose a path, which path to choose, we'll look at some approaches in the next topic on routing. Virtual circuit packet switching is different. It uses packets, in the same as datagram packet switching, but similar to circuit switching, before we send the data, we establish a circuit, or a virtual circuit. We establish a connection from source to destination. So, A sends a special message to 4 saying, I want to send data to F. 4 chooses to send to 7, and to 6, and then F, and F will respond saying, yes, you can send data to me. Once that's done, then A starts sending packets, say the 10 packets. And with virtual circuit packet switching, those packets will follow the same path. They should all follow from 4, 7, 6. So the idea is to do the same as circuit switching. Establish a circuit before we send, but here it's a virtual circuit. We don't have a real circuit. The difference is now we're sending individual packets as opposed to, in circuit switching, we could just send a signal representing all of the data. Compared to datagram packet switching, the packets should take the same path through the network, meaning they should arrive in order. But they may be lost. We send 10 packets from A to F. They, packet 1 arrives at 7, packet 2, packet 3. 
for a short period of time, there are some errors at 7. Maybe the, the, there's a, a failure at the, the device there. Maybe some packets we lost. So at F, it may receive packet 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Maybe packet 3 is lost. They should arrive in order, but some may not arrive at all. Whereas with datagram packet switching, they may arrive out of order and they may be lost. Still, packets need headers in virtual circuit packet switching, so the switches know which is the next switch they send to. Those techniques are described in these slides. It's a similar example to well, a different network to what I've got on the board. Here, datagram approach and the steps. So in this simple example, we have, let's say, 3,000 bytes of data to send from the source to destination. We decide to break it into three separate packets, packet 1, 2, and 3. So the source sends packet 1 to the first switch, then packet 2, then packet 3. And then each switch sends those packets onto the, another switch to reach the destination. So in this time instant, packet, because packet 1 is coming first, it went to this switch, we decided to send it here. And same with packet 2, it's following the same path. But it's possible that packets take different paths in datagram packet switching. So at this point, packet 1 is taking this path, packet 2 is sending across this link, and packet 3 is taking a different path. Simply because this switch decided that the third packet it received sent it along a different path. It doesn't connect those packets it receives with the previous ones, they're independent. Why would it send it along a different path? Maybe it realises that this path is busy. Okay? It was good to send along this path because everything was fast, but after some time it realises this path is, the performance is not good, so it starts sending data across, across a different path. So that's possible. And packets start arriving, and in this simple example, it turns out that packet 3 gets there first. Packet 3 arrives, so packet 3, then packet 1, then packet 2, and then it's up to the destination to put them back into the right order. So we need some sequence numbers in those packets so that the destination knows, even though it's the first packet, packet 3 needs to go at the end. Okay? So the destination puts the packets, puts the data back into the right order. Receiving data out of order can be bad for some applications because putting them back into order and waiting for the first packet uh, causes some delay. It can be bad, say, for video streaming, for voice calls, okay? where you want to receive packets quickly. If you have to wait for a packet, the delay goes up and some applications will not work well. So that's a problem receiving packets out of order. Virtual circuit packet switching, we establish a, not a real circuit, but a virtual circuit from source to destination. This is a, an example where we see A has established a virtual circuit to C if they want to send data and some other virtual circuits. Uh, do we show it? No. How do we establish a vir virtual circuit? We send some special packet in advance. A sends a special packet to F saying, I want to establish a circuit to you. F responds with a special packet. And then they start sending the data. Okay? So there's some setup phase. Once the circuit is set up, then we send our packets and they should follow the same path. Packet 1, 2, and 3. If we've created a circuit along this dash line, then each of those three packets will follow that same path. And they'll all arrive in order at the destination. Okay, that's the advantage compared to datagram packet switching.
So that's the, the basic or the quick concepts of circuit switching, datagram packet switching, and virtual circuit packet switching. We're going to look at some of the issues that arrive in how we compare them. Like the, the packet size, uh, the timing involved, the delay, and so on. Before we go on, any questions on the difference between the three approaches? With packet switching, of course, we send packets. With circuit switching, think that we send a signal representing the data. We establish a circuit from A to F. We have some data. We generate a signal, say an analog signal. When we establish a real circuit, that signal, it's as if it passes through 4, goes along the next link, and keeps going, and is received by F. So with real circuit switching, once we establish a circuit, we have a link from source to the destination, and we can immediately send that data. No need for packets, no need for headers. No one else can use that link from source to destination because the resources are reserved. But with packet switching, we divide our data into packets and send them separately. The difference between datagram and virtual circuit is how we treat them in that what path they take the packets. Let's look at different issues that impact upon the performance and compare the three approaches. Let's compare about reservation of resources and how they, how using packet switching can be more efficient in some cases. Here's two switches in a larger switching network. So there are some more nodes coming in here. I'll not draw them. Send with links into switch one, which has a link to switch two. It may have links to others as well. And switch two has links to others on this side. Just focus on this individual link. Let's assume we have circuit switching. and look at the efficiencies that we can gain from using packet switching. If we have circuit switching, let's say one path, we've reserved a circuit from along this path. It's from some node here to some node over there, which uses a capacity of, if we, the maximum capacity on this link is uh, 10 units. This circuit uses five units, or is reserved five units. Then we can establish a second circuit. Let's say from this node, and let's say that also uses five units. Then we've used the total capacity at this stage. If someone else here wants to create a circuit via this link, they cannot. Okay, this is circuit switching. They'd be rejected in that they'd try to set up a circuit. This switch would say, no, my capacity on this link is 10. I'm currently, currently allocated 10. I cannot establish a new, a new link or a new circuit. So that's circuit switching. This note, the red values here are what's reserved or allocated. The application here 
the rate at which it's sending data may vary over time. It reserves five units because it thinks most of the time it's going to be sending five units of, of data. But the sending rate may go up and down. So it may range, for example, between 0 and 5. So at some point in time, it's sending five units using the full reserved uh, allocation. But other points in time, it may be sending 0, sending nothing. And similar with this link, sometimes the source may be sending no data. Think if we're using this for web, web page transfers. Sometimes you're downloading a web page. Let's say this is server to your computer. So sometimes the server is sending web pages to your computer as fast as possible. But sometimes you're reading the web page. You're not downloading anything. So if you reserved capacity for your web page downloads, sometimes you use that, sometimes you do not. That's inefficient because the times when you're not using this allocated five units, no one else can use it because it's reserved just for you. So that's the inefficiencies of circuit switching. We allocate, if you don't use it, no one else can use it. Let's look at how that works with packet switching. Let's get rid of our circuits. We still have nodes sending at different rates, sending, say, between 0 and 5. So sometimes they're sending data at 5 units, sometimes they're sending nothing. With datagram packet switching, for example, we send packets. If both of these sources are sending at the maximum rate of 5, then we can node the switch 1 can send those packets to switch 2. If they're both sending at a rate of 5, I'll write it in red, at some point in time, this one's sending at 5, this one's sending at 5, we have a capacity of 10, everything's okay. We can send at a rate of 10 those packets. So the switch can send the packets coming from the two sources to node 2. If they were both sending at a lower rate, maybe this one sending at a rate of just one, because it doesn't have to send so much data, and this one, actually make it simple, this one's not sending at all. This node is sending at a rate of five, it's sending to some destination at a rate of five, this one's not sending for a period of time. Then across this link from one to two, we're using 5 plus 0, 5 resources out of the capacity of 10. So we have some resources spare. Who uses that? Well, we could have another user here also sending at this point. If they're sending at a rate of 3, then we can deliver their traffic from 1 to 2 because this coming in is 5 plus 3 plus 0. We can send at a rate of 8 here. So with datagram packet switching, there's no reservation of resources. There's no allocation of resources. The nodes send at some rate. Of course, it may vary over time. And if we have enough capacity on this link, we can send all of the packets satisfying the users in this example. Now, in this case, everything's OK, because this one's sending at 5. This one, at this time instant, is not sending. But sometime later, it starts sending again, sending at a rate of 5. What happens? We've got two nodes sending at a rate of 5. This third node sending at a rate of 3. What happens? So let's say they're sending 5 packets per second, and another one sending 3 packets per second into switch 1. What does switch 1 do? with datagram packet switching. What's it going to do with those packets it's receiving? Can it send them all to switch to? 
can it send them all to switch two? No, because the capacity from the link to switch from switch one to two is ten. So the output capacity is ten. The input coming in is thirteen. We obviously cannot send them all through to switch two. What can we do? Wait. Wait for the capacity. Well, the capacity will not change, but you're right that we can wait or we can let the packets wait. What we do, for example, is that, how can we draw this? Let's say we send, if we give these, this is A, B, and C, we send <coughs> for user A, say at four packets per second, four out of five, it's sending in at five, send out at four, for B maybe three, and for C maybe B2. That is, we send packets at a rate, of course, we cannot exceed the capacity. So coming in is five from computer from user A, going out is four packets per second. What that means is inside this switch, some packets are being stored in a queue. They are waiting. This is queuing delay occurring. Because if we have five coming in from computer A, and only four going out, every second one packet is stored in the queue. And it's sent later. And similar for computer B, some packets are stored in the queue because it's sending in a rate of three and out at a rate of two. And some packets from computer C are stored in the queue. Okay? So we can allow them to send at a rate which exceeds the capacity, but what that means is the packets start to be queued up inside this switch with the hope that sometime later maybe this one reduces its sending rate down to two. And then eventually this one reduces its sending rate, let's say down to one, and the packets which were built up in the queue can now be sent because the amount coming in is less than the amount that which we can send out. Because the sending rate changes over time, what we do is when the amount coming in is less, we can send it all through. When the amount coming in is greater than the capacity, we'll have to queue some packets and send them later. With the hope that sometime later, the amount coming in will go down, giving us a chance to send the queued packets. So what we get in packet switching is that packets containing our data are queued inside the switches. And that's a major contributor to queuing delay. Of course, it depends upon how fast are the nodes sending in and what's the capacity of the output and how the sending rates change over time. For example, coming back to web page transfers, how often are you downloading a web page and how often are you reading it? Okay? So maybe you download for 10 seconds, then you read it for one minute. During that one minute, you're not transferring any data. And that's a chance for others to have their transfer, their data transferred or the queued packets to be sent. So it depends upon how, how the application sends data. And that's why it's difficult, at least in this course, to calculate what the queuing delay would be. How long are they delayed here? It's very difficult to calculate. There's theory about that. But the point is, with packet switching, we can allow more than capacity coming in. With circuit switching, we could not. If this was sending up reserved five, this reserved five, this station B couldn't send anything. But with packet switching, all three can send data. If they exceed the output capacity, packets will be queued. Some extra delay will be incurred. But eventually, they may be sent. Okay? So there's the trade-off with circuit and packet switching. Circuit switching, reserve resources, fixed, with packet switching, the re resources are not reserved and as a result, with varying inputs, we can sometimes be more efficient. We always send data across the link, so the efficiency of the use of the links can go up. So 
So in practice, packet switching is much better suited when the applications are sending data at varying rates. For example, web page transfers. When applications are sending data at a fixed rate, and it's predictable, circuit switching becomes better and just as efficient. One last thing, we will not go through this, with s packet switching. Note that when switch 1 is sending packets to switch 2, switch 2 can be sending packets to another switch. Okay. From 2's perspective, it's receiving packets on one link and sending packets at the same time on another link. And what this diagram tries to illustrate is that the packet size impacts upon the total delay for delivering the data. Because when we have multiple links, so in this example there are three links, X to A, A to B, B to Y, we can be transmitting packets on one link at the same time as receiving on the prior link. And depending upon the packet size, we can reduce the delay to transmit all of the data from A to B, or from X to Y in that case. Have a look at that, see if you can understand it, and tomorrow we'll continue and finish on packet and circuit switching, where we'll go through uh, a final comparison between the two, two approaches. Okay. Enough for today. <laughs>